All right, thank you everybody for joining in today for uh, the event, Keeping the Power On, Sparking Energy Storage Solutions in Developing Countries. This is an event that is hosted by the Global Energy Storage Program, which is an initiative of the Climate Investment Funds of, of the World Bank. Um, my name is Tom Byerly. I'm with Ross Strategic. We're assisting with the program um, for, for this event and we'll be helping to lead people through uh, the sessions that we have planned for today and uh, and planned for tomorrow. So thank you all from join for joining in. I think we have people joining from all around the world uh, and time zones all around the world. Um, if you are in a time zone where it is currently uh, dark outside, what I'm going to ask you to do next will be slightly easier for you. Uh, I'd ask people to, if you are in a place where you can lower the lights, uh, in the area where you are joining the meeting. We have a little opening video uh, that will be most effective in a room that is at least somewhat dim. If we can move to that. All right, now that we've set the mood and charged people up uh, for today's events, what I would like to do uh, is introduce Mafalda Duarte. Mafalda is the CEO of the Climate Investment Funds. Uh, and under her leadership, the $8.3 billion Climate Investment Funds has doubled down to accelerate global action on climate change. Um, from first of its kind investments and approaches to a strong emphasis on learning and sharing knowledge and technical assistance, which is some of the things we'll be doing, doing today. Uh, prior to taking the helm at the CIF in 2014, Ms. Duarte led policy and corporate work on climate-related portfolios for the African Development Bank and the World Bank, and she spent most of her career living and working in more than 30 developing countries. Mafalda, I will turn it over to you to provide an overview of the Climate Investment Funds and the Global Energy Storage Partnership. Thank you very much um, and a big welcome to everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's great to see, I'm seeing here in the chat people from Philippines, from Australia, from, from India, from Sweden, from Germany, it's great. And thank you very much for being with us in these different time zones. Um, and, and thank you also for uh, the, the panelists uh, during this two-day uh, event. Um, as, um, as was mentioned, uh, I'm Mafalda Duarte. I lead the work of the Climate Investment Funds. Um, and, and a big, big welcome to this two-day virtual meeting in these times of, of COVID-19. Uh, today virtual meeting on, on energy storage, uh, which we are very happy to be hosting. Um, so most of you probably are familiar with the Climate Investment Fund, some might not. Uh, these were funds that were established back in 2008 at the time of the financial crisis. And when we weren't really seeing yet much um, momentum or even any, you know, we weren't even seeing uh, first of its kind uh, climate related investments in developing countries. Uh, and really the effort was to bring, uh, to bring concessional patient uh, risk capital uh, to make that capital available at a certain scale through a group of multilateral development banks, make that available to governments and, and private sector um, in developing countries. So the idea was very much to, to spearhead uh, climate-related investments in developing countries. And today, you know, we, we have a, a very interesting large portfolio of more than 300 uh, projects in 72 developing countries. Most of our portfolio is in the energy sector. Uh, in terms of volume of funding, but uh, we also have, uh, you know, operations in, in other sectors uh, as well. Um, our business model is, is a, a business model that is simple, uh, quite effective. Uh, you know, we, we work with six multilateral development banks um, and provide the type of, of capital that, that I was uh, just mentioning. And with that, what we have seen is 
that we've managed to get first of the of its kind projects uh, in in many different countries, um, first, second, third, and have made quite a significant impact in areas such as concentrated solar power or geothermal power development, um, where you know our contribution. Um, alongside the capital of the multilateral development banks, other DFIs and private capital ha has really um, increased the install capacity in these two um, subsectors or within the energy sector quite, quite su substantially. Um, concessional capital uh, is quite important. Um, and you know we have commissioned at some point a study that Bloomberg New Energy Finance did, and they have demonstrated, they demonstrated through that analysis that uh, this type of capital can accelerate uh, important tipping points. Uh, one of which is when clean energy becomes cost competitive with fossil fuels in developing countries. And, and this can be accelerated or fast tracked um, by up to four years. So. You know, when we talk about climate change, we really talk about uh, speed of action. Uh, we are all aware that of the window of opportunity, which is not very large, um, and and the scale of the action that is needed. So, actually, you know, this this point of accelerating these tipping points is is quite critical. Um, we uh, within our energy sector portfolio, you know, we we are supporting the the following key results, 27 gigawatt of new clean power installed, um, 10 million people with improved energy access uh, to energy, and uh, 45 million people supported to cope with effects of, of climate change. So th these are quite um, important numbers. Um, within the overall challenge, it's, it's a drop. But when we see that you know, whatever we are doing is actually instigating the creation of markets that then pick up by themselves and require no more concessional capital. Or, you know, when we see that the cost curves of certain technologies have, have come down and we've made a contribution to that, in particular as well to the learning curves, um, you know, the, the, the impact is quite, quite interesting. Uh, we will have the privilege of, of hearing from uh, the director Dr. Uh, Him Quick, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name <laughs> correctly, and I apologize for that. The Director of Energy Storage Research, Duke of uh, the Office of uh, Electricity at the U.S. Department of Energy. I mean, he will be walking us through quite a lot more in in detail about this the, this topic um, of energy storage. But just you know, a few uh, overarching points on, on my side that we are all very aware of. One is that, of course, renewable energy uh, generation uh, capacity is increasing globally. Um, the cost competitiveness of renewable energy is well known. Um, you know, according to Irina, 56% of all newly commissioned renewable power was cheaper. Uh, than the cheapest new fossil fuel option. So we know that the cost curves um, have, have made renewable energy at parity or below parity in most, uh, most markets. Uh, but we also know that a lot more needs to happen. Um, we know that, you know, and these are data, this is data from the IEA, from the International Energy Agency, GHG emissions from the power sector needs to decline by about 60% between now and 2030. Uh, this, this means very significant increases uh, in, uh, in new capacity. Um, and, and we need to move the energy sector from a global share of renewables in the electricity mix from approximately 27% today to 60% in 2030. Storage will play a very critical role because of the intermittency, intermittent nature of renewables. Um, and you know, while we have approximately um, three, no, like, in fact, we need to have approximately 325 gigawatt of pumped hydroelectric storage and 150 gigawatt of battery storage to, to meet 
that uh, global share of renewable energy of 45% by 2030, which is, which is an important uh, target. Um, more even is needed if we are to reach the 60% renewables uh, by, by 2030, which would put us on the net zero uh, path. Um, but, you know, we are far from that. Most of what we see in the market is uh, pumped storage, um, but battery storage is just over three gigawatt, uh, for example. And most of this is, uh, most of these investments are happening in developed countries. Um, so from the projects that are being commissioned, only 20% are being commissioned in developing countries, while there has, you know, so, so the challenge in developing countries, the, the global challenge is large, the challenge in developing countries um, is quite significant. Um, and, and, and we set up this global energy storage program uh, under the climate investment funds with our partners, the six multilateral development banks to really drive this agenda forward. Uh, this is not the first time we are making investments on, on storage solutions. We already have a portfolio uh, of more than 400, $400 million, uh, and these include projects in South Africa and India, battery projects, thermal storage combined with CSP in Morocco, or mini-grid connected batteries in Cambodia. We will also hear later today uh, from uh, the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Environment in Maldives, uh, Mr. Ajwad Mustafa. Um, and he will tell us a, a little bit also about the investments we have uh, supported uh, in Maldives and the impact has also been quite, quite important and significant. Um, so we, we are not new to this, uh, to this area, but we felt collectively that there was a need for um, a much more focused, uh, targeted um, uh, initiative. So we, we did uh, establish this uh, global energy uh, storage program to drive that agenda much more significantly at the, and at a different pace uh, forward. Um, so we very much look forward to, uh, to, to doing more and doing more with many of you here today. Um, we are also interested as, you know, it's always been a key objective of the climate investment funds to drive the learning agenda. In fact, one of our founding objectives was to be a learning lab. Uh, on, on climate finance. Um, and so we are we're quite happy to, in the context of this uh, <clears throat> global energy storage program to, uh, to, to drive, to, to establish a sort of like a learning platform, uh, which this event today is part of. We expect to organize other events with this purpose to really support the dialogue and, and knowledge exchange and the building of networks uh, between ourselves and a range of stakeholders and see if we can forge, you know, partnerships um, or enable forging of partnerships that will drive, you know, more investments um, into this uh, area. Uh, we are uh, closely collaborating with, for example, the Energy Storage Partnership of the World Bank, uh, which Chandra will be talking about uh, in, a, in, a, in a while. Um, and others and other initiatives. Um, so very much look forward um, to having you in future discussions in today, future discussions. And again, as I was saying, see if we can together, um, you know, scale up the momentum uh, in terms of learning and the investments uh, in this area. This uh, program, the Global Energy Storage Program that we, we established it thanks to contributions from uh, two of our shareholders, the United Kingdom and Germany. Um, and, and it is the first time, as I mentioned before, that the CIF has a dedicated funding window for, for a specific uh, sector. So we are excited to have Soren Deng from Germany here today to tell us more about their vision um, and their the German contribution for, for this uh, program. So with that, and hopefully I didn't exceed my time, my team was telling me I should stick to my time, 
Uh, I wasn't really keeping track, but hopefully I didn't exceed it too much. Again, thank you very much. I look very much look forward to the discussion and to this interactive uh, engagement plan for today and tomorrow. Thank you. Mafalda, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for for uh, the introduction and for making making today possible. Um, let's see. It looks like we have had several more people join us from all around the world. Uh, folks are chatting in where they are uh, they are coming in from, and so it's so great to see everybody here today. My name is uh, Tom Byerly with Ross Strategic. We're helping to support uh, the event today, and I'll help uh, lead through. Um, lead through our sessions today and tomorrow. I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the meeting and some of the logistics to help people participate most effectively. And then we'll move forward with, with the program. If we could move to the next slide, please. So we uh, today is the first of two days for this event. We really hope that people will join in um, for for both days. We'll be starting again tomorrow at this at this same time. And we've we, we kind of have two different focuses or emphasis for the two days. Today is really kind of setting the stage for the role of energy storage in the context of clean energy systems and really these transformations that Mafalda was talking about about moving towards clean energy systems and the role that a broad range of energy storage um, can play in that transformation. And then tomorrow we'll be doing a bit of a deeper dive into implementation and some of the key opportunities, some of the key challenges, what it is that we need to be doing together to really accelerate the use of energy storage and help support the transition to clean energy systems. And as Mafalda was just saying, this really is about helping to scope out this learning platform. You'll be hearing a lot today and tomorrow from experts in the field about where we are with energy storage, um, its appropriate role and the various types of technologies um, that, are, that are available. But we also wanna be using this meeting for getting a sense from all of you about what are some of those key challenges and opportunities that would be helpful for us to dive into together as we move through the year and have future events that might focus on technology or policy or finance or other aspects of, of energy storage. So we're both looking to inform um, all of you who are participating in this event, but also draw from you your thoughts about what is most useful to engage on going forward. Um, we'll be doing kind of a mix of large group and small group uh, in engagement. We'll be mostly in plenary today. At the end of the day, we'll move into some breakout sessions and we'll give instructions for that at the appropriate time to hear some more about specific projects that multilateral development banks are investing in um, around, around the country. Uh, we'll also have some opportunity for networking and I'll talk about that uh, in just a minute. Um, maybe we could go to the next slide. Um, so just to help people use Zoom effectively, um, we're all over a year into this, so I'm sure everyone is, is feeling quite confident in Zoom, uh, Zoom skills. But I did want to note that we'll be recording this meeting, the recording and the slides that will be presented will be available at the event website, and we'll make sure to get that link and information out to everybody who's participating. If people are having any difficulties with um, troubleshooting, there's an email on the screen, twendell at Rostri strategic.com and we'll chat that in as well um, and that is one of my colleagues at Ross Strategic who can help anybody with um, technology issues behind behind the scenes so that is my colleague Tess uh, feel free to email her if you need any any help um, and that at the end of the day to today as we go into the breakout rooms we'll be using a different link than the one that we're using right now that will um, move people into other zoom rooms but we'll make sure that that is very clear uh, at at the time. Um, just to note, all the participants um, will be muted uh, coming in. We've turned on closed captioning uh, for the meeting today um, with live transcriptions. You can turn that on or off on your, um, on your dashboard. Uh, and then it's clear to me from the chats that are coming in that people are actively using, using chat and I encourage you, uh, encourage you to do that. So thank you very much. We go to the next slide, please. 
All right. Um, we are going to be doing some polling and we're going to be asking you for questions throughout uh, the events today and tomorrow. And we're using the platform Slido uh, for, for that. We'll be getting some more experience with that over the course of, of today. But we did want to um, just make sure we've got people on, on the platform right now. So this is a, a platform that you can use on your, on your phone. Uh, and I think in some ways I have it set up on mine right now. Um, and that may be the easiest ways to, way to use it. You can also go uh, and use it through your, your browser. Um, so for folks who have their phones with them or have a browser available, I encourage you right now to go to uh, slido.com and bring that up. And when you come into that screen, you will see a place where it's asking you to enter a meeting code and we've indicated on the screen here where those those are it should be quite obvious as you go in your browser or on on your phone and our meeting code will be one two one three one two um, that you'll enter in there and what you will see when you do that is a place for uh, questions and questions and answers and you can type in your questions there and one of the advantages of Slido is if you see a question that somebody else has entered and you have that question as well you can actually just upvote uh, the question using the, the little um, thumbs up over on the right hand right hand side and that'll help us elevate some of the key questions that a number of people who are participating have. So why don't we just give that a little bit of a of a try. Maybe we can go to the next slide and I see that we've chatted in the Slido link in the meeting code. Um, so what I'd like people to do who are on S Slido is just let us know using the Q&A function what is the question about energy storage you'd most like answered today and tomorrow. So it's a question that's asking you to enter a question that is top of mind for you in Slido. And why don't I just give folks a minute or so to try that, try that out. Great, I'm seeing some questions starting to come, starting to come in. Excellent, this is great. Thank you, thank you all for uh, uh, for showing us that this this will work, and I, and these questions that are coming in um, sound great about the cost effectiveness of different types of storage solutions, the pace of uh, development and and implementation, different types of storage and their uses and sources of of value. So these are all things that we um, we expect to be covering. Uh, today and and tomorrow, and we'll we'll also be looking at this more to make sure that we're addressing some of the key questions that folks have either in the programming uh, for the events today and tomorrow or in in future programming. So I encourage you to keep the questions coming in, um, and as we are listening to some of the experts that we have lined up uh, for today, uh, please use the Q and A function in in Slido to be able to pose some questions for them. So when we get to the discussion time, we're able to bring those into the conversation. All right, maybe we can move to the next slide. All right, uh, this slide is just a little bit of a teaser. Um, we we've, we've, we've have set up um, a networking space uh, for the end of the day tomorrow um, that will provide people with an opportunity to interact with other participants in the meeting and in kind of an informal setting. We'll have it set up with some thematic areas for people who are particularly interested in say technology or finance or, um, or policy. And it's a little bit of an experiment. It's one of the things we're trying to do while we're all in uh, virtual remote mode to be able to connect people as if we were as if we were together. So one of the encouragements to join tomorrow and, and uh, stay through the, the end of the event is to be able to join us in, in Gather at that time and we'll provide some more information along the line. All right, why don't we move to the next slide? 
All right. Uh, let's see. I want to um, move to a, a, a donor a, announcement, and I believe we have Dr. Soren Deng, the head of the division for the German Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, and I. I believe we might also have Dr. Jürgen Karl Zattler, the Director General for International Development Policy, with us as as well. Um, so I will I will turn it over to you. Thank you for joining. Oh, Dr. Deng, it looks like you are on mute. There you now, go. can you hear me now? We can. Thank you. Thank you very much. So good afternoon from Germany and uh, good morning in the US. Uh, I'm Zürn Deng, I'm the head of the Division uh, for Energy, Hydrogen, Infrastructure and Raw Materials within the German uh, Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. And I'm uh, here today instead of, of Jürgen Sattler, my uh, Director General, who unfortunately was not able to join as planned before uh, today, but he has asked me to to uh, speak in or to on to speak on on his behalf, and so I would like to uh, say hello to all of you, Mrs. Stuart and Mr. Papadonasio, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, for Germany, this program is uh, really uh, an important one, and looking to the situation we are facing now, COVID nineteen has. We all know brought a slight decrease in global CO2 emissions, but of course that's no sustainable reduction uh, and climate change remains a question of human survival. Only if we are able to keep, to keep climate change in check, we can maintain a livable planet for future generations. And we have on the same time to face that the energy section the energy, energy sector, sorry, is key to success. It is responsible for more than two thirds of greenhouse gas emissions worldwide. So we are facing today a double challenge. On the one hand, there's a dramatically increasing energy demand all over the globe. And on the other hand, we have to address this demand with substantially reduced CO2 emissions. In order to scale up renewable energy investments in emerging markets, we, in Germany, follow a three-pronged approach. At international level, we drive the political agenda for global energy transformation, especially in our role as a global champion for energy transition within the upcoming UN high-level dialogue on energy. At bilateral level, we support partner governments in advancing their energy transition by providing policy advice. That means on long-term energy planning, grid and system integration of renewables, as well as technolog technology innovations such as green hydrogen. Finally, we actively promote renewable energy investments by providing technical and financial assistance for project developers and investors. With a growing share of var variable uh, renewable energies, fundamental changes to our energy systems have to be set into motion. In order to succeed in er eradicating poverty and creating economic prosperity, it is important that energy is available in the right moment, in the right amount, the right time, at the right place, and in the right quality. A continuous power supply enables productive use and promotes economic development, especially in rural areas. But we all know that renewable energy is not as stable as fossil energy. Sun is not shining all over, uh, it's not shining over the night, or the wind is not strong enough all over day and night. So we need energy storage systems. They can help to drive the application of renewable energies as an integrated supply solution by providing affordable and sustainable energy in line with the needs of agricultural, commercial, and industrial uses. They are also thus, they are thus also an important element of Germany's development cooperation for a low carbon future. The use of different flexibility options, 
from flexible producers and consumers to storage to the expansion of electricity grids and real-time power markets are playing an increasingly important role in the system integration of reliable and sustainable renewable energy sources. Effective and efficient storage technologies are a game changer to facilitate reliable energy access based on decentral, decentralized renewables, off and mini grid solutions, for example. From a development cooperation perspective, modern energy storage solutions offer tremendous opportunities to facilitate the deployment of renewable energies, enhance energy access, and provide a foundation for economic development and prosperity in underserved regions of the world. This is exactly the goal of, for example, our Green People's Energy for Africa initiative, which is a part of the Marshall Plan with Africa, which drives the grassroots energy transition in rural areas of Africa based on the use of distributed renewable energies and storage solutions. We know about the importance of energy storage and therefore Germany supports the Climate Investment Fund's Global Energy Storage Program with the contribution of 80 million euro to promote and accelerate the energy transition worldwide. With this contribution, we would like to encourage the CIFs to take on a leading role in promoting innovative initiatives with transformative impact in the energy storage sector with the aim to re reducing costs for storage solutions and on the same time increase access to renewable energy for people in developing countries. We expect the CIFs to use its comparative advantage of bringing together the multilateral development banks and the program of the CIFs should use the combined knowledge of all implementers in order to come up with the best innovative and transformational sorry, uh, ideas. Multilateral development banks are key for achieving the goals of the Paris Agreement. Therefore, they need to make an additional effort in aligning their work to the goals of the Paris Agreement. The CIFs provide a favorable environment for the MDBs to coordinate better, to complement each other and to further learn from each other in order to accelerate the implementation of the Agenda 2030 and the Paris Agreement. And the energy storage partnership convened by the World Bank, by ESMA, which is Germany also, which Germany is also supporting, can further support capacity building and knowledge exchange in the context of the uh, energy storage program. Germany is looking forward to join forces, forces with its partners and drive action, building momentum for the from the political processes, including the COP26 energy, 26 energy transition campaign and the UN high level dialogue on energy. Therefore, Germany is taking on the role of a global champion for the energy transition in the UN HLD. And we see HLDE and COP26 as milestones for a coordinated, harmonized and joint effort to promote a structured energy transition to protect the climate. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Deng. We very much appreciate it. Maybe we can move to, move to the next uh, slide. And I'd like to introduce uh, Chandra Govindarajalu from the World Bank. And Chandra will be talking about the Energy Sector Management Assistance Program and Energy Storage Partnership. Chandra leads the Global Battery Storage Program at the World Bank and has over 20 years of experience working there and at the International Finance Corporation on energy efficiency, energy access, and renewable energy across 15 countries in South Asia, East Asia, the Middle East, and, and North Africa. Chandra, thanks so much for joining, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, good, good morning, good afternoon uh, to all colleagues uh, from across the world. It's really a pleasure to be here talking to all of you. 
uh, first uh, our director, uh, Dr. Dimitrios Papanatis, who was supposed to join today, uh, but he finds himself on a plane uh, thanks to some uh, flight reschedules that are now common in these pandemic times. Um, so, uh, yeah, as, uh, as uh, Mafalda and Dr. Um, Deng uh, referred to, uh, energy storage and battery storage uh, can be a game changer as we look to decarbonize our energy systems um, and also um, reach the 800 million people who don't have any access to electricity today, mainly in sub-Saharan Africa and parts of Asia. In addition, uh, this is also really helpful um, to create resiliency in grids. Uh, as we see, as we witness uh, more and more uh, events, extreme weather events. So not only from a mitigation perspective, also from an adaptation perspective, this is interesting. So energy storage, um, energy uh, sector management assistance program is a program within the bank, within the World Bank that provides upstream um, support uh, to client countries. Um, as they think through uh, various energy uh, options. And uh, we have a dedicated program uh, on uh, energy storage to help our client countries. So broadly, it has got two pillars. Uh, one is supporting development of new investments, uh, which would mean um, helping clients with setting up the policy regulatory framework, um, undertaking uh, valuation assessments that are so critical uh, to make battery storage viable, um, to, uh, to build, to have training, uh, to build capacity of institutions to be able to implement um, you know, these projects. And also probably most importantly, undertake uh, pre-feasibility level assessments uh, for projects so that they can then be ready for financing by entities like the World Bank or the other MDBs or, or, and including SIF uh, for the GESP pipeline. So those are the type of uh, support um, elements we have in our, on the investment side. Uh, and the second part um, and the more important part I would say is also the knowledge piece. Uh, where uh, we provide uh, support, uh, we, pro we provide support on um, on uh, how you know how knowledge best uh, knowledge can be distilled from global experience, um, from other developing country experience, and brought to bear on the new projects that are being developed by our clients, and uh, also build capacity. Uh, from lessons from other other um, other programs and other countries, and also it is a critical because the nature of this technology itself, it's uh, as you would um, appreciate. This is a rapidly changing landscape uh, with new technologies, new chemistries, battery chemistries, uh, all the time evolving. Um, as Mafalda mentioned, the cost is decreasing but also the options are or you know increasing so to keep a keep a keep a tab on what is changing what is more appropriate how do we make the technology choice uh, in these changing circumstances so that you're not uh, you know you're not stranded with the costs um, of technology that is now obsolete or uh, so with that in mind with all these parameters around uh, in mind, which is basically how do you scale up the market for early in, um, in emerging markets? And also how do we bring, uh, how do we cope with this rapidly changing landscape? Um, the ESMAP program has started the energy storage partnership. We launched the energy storage partnership in association with partners from across the world, uh, from Europe, uh, from, the, from North America, from Asia, Africa. We have 
uh, today over 36 uh, partners that are contributing to, to this partnership. And we have, uh, we have client countries uh, as well in that. We organize uh, meetings every um, six months or so. And these meetings are um, prefixed, if I will, if I will by uh, presentations from our client countries about challenges they are facing, about the issues on, on, uh, on battery storage that they would like to bring. And the work program of the partnership is determined by these uh, uh, client presentation. So we will uh, we will hear a little more about our projects uh, later on today uh, from Maldives and uh, from uh, Ukraine as well. So uh, with this in mind, we created the Energy Storage Partnership as an international cooperation platform uh, to focus in um, primarily four areas. Uh, technology demonstration, um, uh, policies, regulation and procurement, uh, system planning tools, how do we coordinate around that, and enabling systems for management and sustainability. So those are the four areas. We have ha already uh, been working for a year and uh, I'm pleased to report that also one of the MDBs, uh, IDB is part of the partnership and we hope that others will also join. Uh, so we have um, uh, produced several um, uh, knowledge pieces from this uh, partnership uh, so operation in the first year. We will discuss more about that tomorrow. Uh, one of the key areas is uh, uh, that I would like to flag is on uh, like test beds and innovation. Uh, so as the technology rapidly is changing, we need to be able to uh, uh, you know, reduce the risk around how do we introduce these products in the market. And one option for that is to have uh, test beds. And there has been interest from our client countries, uh, uh, especially Morocco, South Africa, and India, on how we can create test beds that can help, uh, you know, help reduce risks in safety, functionality, and profitability allow the pace of performance demonstration to keep up with the pace of the market, uh, provide uh, performance, vital performance information that can then inform uh, instruments for risk reductions, uh, such as uh, warranties and help mobilize commercial capital to the energy storage sector. And also finally build local technical and institutional capacity. So uh, that, is, that is our focus in the current year of um, ESP and we hope we are successful uh, along with partners and that will help bring new projects to cli you know, climate investment funds because one of the issues that we face is that um, our clients are uh, interested in storage, they would like to do it, uh, but there is also the risk and the, the tendency is to go towards a tried and tested, whether it's track record, which is lithium ion. So in order to break, in order, in order to go beyond that, uh, we would need the support of, um, uh, you know, facilities such as test beds to demonstrate so that we can bring new, new, uh, new technologies that are more, that may be more relevant for the developing country context, uh, which are characterized by high temperatures, lower capacity, and so on. So, uh, so that is that's really the idea uh, behind this energy storage partnership and the test beds um, idea that uh, you know that is being um, discussed as part of that. Um, first test bed will uh, hopefully come up in Morocco in a year or so, and then we hope that in the meantime we also develop South Africa and India. I think I will stop there with my introductory remarks at this point. Uh, over to you, Tom. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Chandra, so much. And, and as Chandra indicated, we'll have some more time uh, towards the end of the event today to talk about some of the projects that the multilateral development banks are investing in in South Africa, Maldives, other parts of the world that Chandra alluded to. And, and Chandra will be back tomorrow uh, talking some more about some of the knowledge pieces that he, um, that he described. All right. Um, let's see. Maybe we could go to the next slide. Uh, so it gives me great pleasure uh, at, at this point to uh, introduce Dr. Imre Zhuk, 
uh, as our keynote speaker for, for today. Um, he is the Director of Energy Storage Research at the Office of Electricity uh, at the U.S. Department of Energy, which is uh, both through the Department of Energy and the labs, a great partner in the work that the uh, Global Energy Storage Program is conducting. Um, so for the past two decades, Dr. Juk has directed the Electrical Energy uh, Storage Research Program uh, at the Office of Electricity, developing a portfolio of storage technologies for a broad spectrum of application. He supervised the 185 million uh, stimulus funding for grid scale energy storage demonstration and is now partnering on storage projects for grid resilience. Uh, Dr. Juk has a PhD in theoretical particle physics from Purdue University and has taught at Syracuse University, University of Wisconsin, and Kuwait University and has a, a long list of uh, research and development awards, green chemistry challenge awards, lifetime achievement uh, awards from leading energy storage organizations and is an internationally recognized leader in the energy storage field. So Dr. Juk, thank you so much for joining us uh, today and we look forward to, to your remarks. Okay, it's a pleasure to be here with uh, the uh, Climate Investment Fund and uh, to be able to do this uh, small address uh, to you after the presentations by the previous speakers. I want to talk mainly about the future, about energy storage and deep decarbonization. Next, please. If you were to soar above the globe, you would see patches of light. Those are the area where we have not only light, but where we have electricity, where we have commerce, where science is happening. These patches of light occur particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, the United States, Europe, India, China, Japan. And there is a smaller Southern belt, belt in Brazil, uh, Argentina, uh, South Africa, and uh, the coastal areas of Australia. But then there are dark areas. One billion people lack access to light, electricity, and commerce. And that is the concern uh, at the moment. Uh, can we see the next uh, slide, please? The electricity, of course, is brought to you by, it, by and large by the grid the electric grid. And the grid used to be simple and deterministic. There was fossil fuel generations and there was the load. And in between you have transmission. And we have spent the last hundred years or so developing transmission. Next, please. But the world has become much more complicated. We now no longer have fossil fuel alone. We have renewable generation, wind and solar PV. The load also has become more comp uh, complex. Uh, we have distributed generation and we have electrification in the form of uh, electric vehicles and uh, electric heating and other forms of decarbonization. Now, we have variable generation and we have variable load. And it's not enough to just have transmission, we need storage in between as a buffer. Next, please. So, energy storage provides energy when it is needed just as transmission provides energy where it is needed. Next. 
So at the Department of Energy, uh, two de decades ago, we decided that this sort of situation that we saw happening uh, needed the development of a specific energy storage program. At that time, uh, there was very little interest in energy storage. Uh, utilities uh, were not involved in it and uh, nobody really knew about it and there were no meetings uh, about energy storage and very little research. So we developed a program that envelops the entire area of energy storage, starting with materials, going on to devices and systems. Uh, we developed analysis methods. Uh, we worked on standards and protocols and on to policy and finance. And we are teaming with national laboratories such as Sandia, PNL and Oak Ridge. And we work with industry, states and utilities. Uh, and yes, we get a lot of awards. Thank you. The next please. So where to start with energy storage? Well, the first idea, the first viable idea after the initial niche projects was frequency regulation. It occurred to us that these small uh, up and downs on the grid could very nicely be handled with energy storage. Uh, the usual met method was to use the fossil fuel generations, uh, have a little bit in reserve, and then uh, give you a, bit, a little bit more on the grid and a little bit less. The trouble is there that the response time of this is considerably greater than the duration of the fluctuations itself. Storage, on the other hand, can respond instantaneously and uh, therefore it provides a good solution. Next, please. We brought this into reality, uh, working with the California uh, Energy Commission on the one hand and NYSERDA in New York on the other hand. And we had our first small installations, which eventually uh, accelerated into big uh, installations uh, of 20 megawatts. And we used flywheels at that time uh, to uh, as the uh, energy storage provider. But the important thing is that these demonstrations provided the basis for the Federal Energy Re Regulatory Commission to establish a new way of getting paid. It's pay for performance. You're no longer paid just for capacity, you're paid for performance. And that provided the first business case for energy storage. Next. Another thing that uh, made it clear that we need energy storage is the by now famous California duck curve. The thing is that California is, uh, deployed more and more uh, photovoltaics but of course only during the daytime. So the load that the utilities are seeing during the daytime was going down, rapidly going down. Now this is wonderful, except for one fact, it creates a very steep ramp in the morning and in the evening for about two hours. And because of this ramp, uh, storage is required for the transition. And that created the Cali famous California mandate of 1.3 gigawatt of storage. Next, please. So this is all very nice, but what is needed is a systematic approach for designing business cases. What we need to do is we need to balance the cost of storage systems 
against the value of storage systems. And until we have business cases for storage, we are ne re not really moving the technology along at the pace that it needs to be moved along. The cost is fairly clear. Uh, in the main, uh, there is the storage device itself, the batteries, if you wish, or whatever other technology you're using, such as flywheels or what have you. But we also have to consider the power electronics and the control mechanisms. And then there is the balance of plant, uh, the facility. And while the cost of energy storage itself has been going down very considerably, the cost of the power electronics and of the balance of plant have not been going down as rapidly at all. Balance of plant includes uh, the building or the container that you put the storage into. It includes the land, the rental of the land. It includes the cost of money. It includes insurance. It includes uh, the air conditioning systems the fire protection systems, uh, the cost of the building inspector and, and the lawyers. And uh, these are an appreciable amount of the cost of a facility. Now the value uh, is fairly clear when you are in a regulated area, uh, but if it's unregulated, uh, then you, you have to be a little bit more careful. So. We have things available like arbitrage, frequency regulation, demand charges by the month and the year. These uh, come with markets and they have specific value. But there are also, besides these monetized values, there are unmonetized values, such as resiliency, such as uh, availability to withstand disasters, uh, assurance, military assurance, what have you. And these metrics that we use will depend crucially on regulatory structure uh, and on the locality. Next, please. So, uh, we and others developed tools for valuation that allow us to look at uh, what the value proposition is, what are the benefits, what are the costs. And uh, this particular one is by Sandia and it's available for the public. Uh, other organizations such as EPRI have developed uh, tools as well. Next, please. Ideally, when we start a project, we do the analysis first. We decide whether there is, are enough benefits to warrant a project, and then we go ahead. Uh, here are a few examples. Uh, Sterling, Massachusetts, for example. They had developed a grant from the state of Massachusetts, uh, but it wasn't clear what they were going to do uh, with this. The original idea was to simply put a battery into, a, into the police station and make sure the police station could fun function during outage, outages. And uh, we approached them, we said, well, wouldn't you like to make some money? And we showed them that by using these various benefits, uh, they could actually get a return on investment of about six years. And uh, indeed, they did this, and uh, you can see the groundbreaking here. And three months later, you can already see the installation of the facility. Uh, that was unusually fast. And from the first day on, benefits were realized. And these benefits fall into arbitrage, the monthly peaks, uh, that lead to demand avoidance of demand charges and the yearly peaks. For a total of about $400,000 saved. And the graph shows you how the monthly uh, cost, monthly savings and the yearly savings uh, mount up. Capital cost was about $2.7 million. 
and uh, it started in December of 2016. And by April of 2019, we had been able to save the town uh, $1 million in avoided costs. Next, please. Another project in Cordova, Alaska, a small uh, fi uh, fishing town is actually a very large fishing fleet, but the town is small. And they were running entirely on run of the river hydro. Well, hydro is fairly cheap, but in order to follow the load, they needed diesel. And the diesel is not cheap at all, particularly not in Alaska. It's about 10 times as much as the hydro. So we got together with them and we developed a solution that includes a one megawatt, one hour battery, which was uh, commissioned in June of 2019. And uh, the system has been running very smoothly since then. And we have been able to avoid a large amount of diesel and of course the diesel emissions as well. Next, please. And here's one on Nantucket Island, a small island off the coast of Massachusetts. And the problem was there that the island is served by uh, underwater cables, which are expensive and uh, partially due to uh, a lot of tourists coming to Nantucket, it became clear that the two old cables were no longer sufficient and they would have to put a third cable in. Well, studies showed that by not installing a cable, but installing a storage unit, you could actually realize more benefits and have a better situation than before. So over the lifetime of the project, uh, we are looking at, a, looking at $110 million deferral value and $35 million in operational benefits. Return on investment is about 1.5, which is quite good. Uh, we had the ribbon cutting in 2019. Next, please. And here is a very tiny project, which we hope to get in uh, going uh, in the next year or two. It's on the Kwikchak, Kwikchak River. It's a fishing village. And they would like to have a microgrid. And we are help, helping them uh, installing meters and get a good baseline on the diesels and on the load profile for the town. Uh, once the microgrid is installed uh, with storage units, uh, we are going to analyze the battery performance, the fuel uh, usage, the load profile, and we will show whether or not this is an effective use of energy storage. Next, please. So these were just a few small examples but they lead to bigger installations because they were they are in general cutting edge installations that show the way to new business cases. Well, many applications have been identified, valuation models have been developed, uh, business cases with multiple benefit streams have been established, and you can find these in the Global Energy Storage Database uh, which uh, we uh, maintain at sandia.gov. Next, please. Altogether, energy storage has proven to be a resounding success, and we are looking forward, uh, for example, in 2025, to have a $7.3 billion annual market. Next, please. And it's not only uh, that projects have been established, the states of the United States have developed appropriate regulatory structure. Uh, co states on the West Coast and on the East Coast and a few in the middle uh, now have uh, regulations 
on the books by their public utility commissions or by their uh, state government that uh, enable energy storage to uh, be deployed in a more stable uh, regulatory environment. You can find these in the energy storage policy database, which again is available for free. Next, please. And what has emerged is what I like to call storage ecologies, areas where storage has become uh, accepted as a solution to the problems. California, of course, uh, New York on the East Coast, uh, the Northwest states with Washington, Oregon, and Alaska, uh, the Southwest with New Mexico and Arizona, and the Northeast with Massachusetts, Vermont, uh, Maine, uh, and other places uh, where uh, there's considerable development. Now, in all of those, we have congressional and state support. We have regulatory structure. Uh, in some of them, we have national laboratories and universities which help, utilities which understand the pro uh, problem, and real projects being deployed. Next, please. Virtually all of these projects, though, are lithium ion. And lithium ion does have problems. One of the problems is in sourcing. There are ecological and sociological issues. Uh, the way lithium is mined, uh, it's only a few countries that uh, have lithium. Uh, we need a much broader base. Uh, the conditions under which they are mined, and not only lithium, but uh, cobalt and other materials as well, uh, are not always the best. Uh, we have to avoid uh, these situations, which do not take into account the well-being of native populations. There are also problems with safety and reliability. Uh, every now and then, when we think we have uh, found how to operate these things properly, uh, one of the facilities will have a spectacular fire, uh, not really acceptable. And finally, reuse, recycling, and disposal have certainly not been uh, solved. Uh, unlike, uh, for example, lead acid batteries, which can be 98% recycled, uh, lithium ion batteries are largely not recycled. Next, please. And that is why we work on new technologies. Because to achieve real sustainability, we would ultimately like to have a circular technology based on earth abundant and inexpensive materials. We have to look towards iron, sulfur, zinc. Uh, those are the things we need in our batteries. The supply chain and the waste stream must be part of the design of not only the battery, but of the entire energy storage approach. Next, please. Which brings us to something else, and that is social equity. We have to avoid at all costs having the benefits of this new technology accrue mainly to the affluent parts of society and the affluent countries. In the US, for example, uh, large segments of the community are experiencing energy insecurity. And these communities include Native Americans, the Black community, and the Hispanic community. Lower income households are disproportionately non-white. Storage can help with social equity. Uh, and indeed, we have now established a, an initiative to develop metrics and projects to dive into this, pro uh, into this problem of uh, social equity 
and to make sure that the advantages of renewable energy are brought to all segments of society. Next, please. So, the future. Many states in the US have now adopted 2015 as their planning horizon for becoming 100% renewable and to establish deep decarbonization. That includes electric vehicles, port decarbonization, what have you. 2050 is fairly soon. If we are going to have a deep penetration of renewables, we will need corresponding development of energy storage. Next, please. And while the transmission grid spans the continent and is a marvel of technology, storage so far really only covers rather modest durations. We are talking about 15 minute durations like in frequency regulation, one hour duration such as in peak shaving and at the outset, four hours. This also happens to cover what uh, lithium ion batteries can cover well. As an example, in 2020, quarter three, uh, 476 megawatts were established in the US, but that amounts only to 764 megawatt hours, about one and a half hours of duration. That is not enough uh, for what we will need in the future. Next, please. As the penetration of renewable generation continues to increase, incremental solutions of the kind that we've been doing will no longer be sufficient. We cannot just do uh, the kind of small, relatively smallish uh, projects that uh, address uh, projects, uh, problems such as frequency regulation, uh, demand, uh, uh, demand charges and so on. We will need longer duration storage. Eight hours, 12 hours, days, and perhaps even seasons. Because renewable energy is variable over a much larger range of time scales. Next, please. So what's available? Well, Lithium ion, of course, will continue go down, at least the cells will. That does not mean that the facilities will go down that far, fast. Uh, we have flow battery technologies such as vanadium redox. We have uh, new technologies like zinc manganese oxide, low temperature sodium, aqueous soluble organics for flow batteries. And there is still advanced lead acid batteries, which we may drive down to a cost such as uh, $35 per kilowatt hour. So there are technologies. They are not yet dirt cheap, but at least there is the promise of considerable reduction in, course, in cost. Next, please. And on the horizon, we will be looking at better lithium, we will be looking at non-lithium technologies, vanadium redox, what have you. Uh, we will have to consider vehicle to grid, perhaps not in individual vehicles, but in fleets, such as school bus, postal and military fleets. We will consider thermal storage in building. We will have to play with demand management. Uh, we will introduce non-battery technologies, stacking cement blocks, rail systems that have small carts going up inclines, uh, compressed air energy storage, pumped hydro, which of course is already well developed, and uh, thermal systems of which there are quite a few, including liquid air uh, available. And then there are chemical solutions such as hydrogen and ammonia, which at the moment are very costly and which have 
uh, potential side effects on the environment, but nonetheless need to be considered. Next, please. The question is, what will be the business case for long duration storage? It's not an easy question at all. It may involve such things as mandates. Uh, we don't like mandates, but it may be necessary in order to bring long duration storage into existence. Next, please. We need to develop new metrics and new models that allow inclusion of social equity and environmental values in the operation of utilities and in statewide integrated resource planning. We need to use systems dynamics to show how all the interrelated factors work together and evolve through times. The important thing is we are here, we need to go there. We don't really know how to do that. But we do know that it will take everything we have. Next, please. We need to take care of the environment, but we must also take care of each other. Next. The goal is clear. 100% decarbonization by 2050. And it has to be around the entire world. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Juk. Uh, we really appreciate it. And I think some of the issues that you have raised are ones that we are really going to be di starting to dive into today and, and tomorrow. And one of the times that we will be able to dive into those is uh, after a break that we'll take here uh, in just a few minutes. We'll return from the break to a panel that will talk about many needs and many storage solutions. And we'll hear from experts from Bloomberg, from NREL, from IRENA, from uh, the Republic of the Maldives about how they're addressing some of the challenges and opportunities that Dr. Juk uh, Dr. Juk laid out. Um, I do want to uh, uh, make sure, Dr. Juk, as you said, we are taking care of each other. And one of the ways we will do that is by allowing people to take a little bit of a break uh, here. We'd like to return um, to the regular session at about, it's about 20 after now. Why don't we return at 25 after the hour, whatever that hour is where you are. Um, but we have a little a activity we'd like people to do during, during the break. Um, so what we'd like you to do during the break is a little bit of a, a treasure hunt. Uh, and just please to identify something in your room, wherever you are, uh, that serves the purpose of storage. And when we come back from the break, we'll see what, uh, what people have identified. So well, let's return at uh, 25 after, and we will be able to jump in then to our panel on many needs and many storage solutions. Hello, Nate. Thanks for joining. Hi, happy to be here. And you sound nice and loud and clear for our next session. So, okay, we'll great. Go. Great. I will be, uh, I'll be right back then. Yep. Sounds good. Wait, maybe we could just check in on a couple of other panelists um, for the next session. Yaya, are you able to jump off of ah. mute and we can do a sound check? I am off mute. Can you hear me? We can. That's great. Thanks so much. Amazing. Great. <laughs> All right. How about Roland? Hi. Good afternoon. Great. That's sounds... Good morning. No, good evening to you. No, no good morning. 
I think they all apply. Thank you, Roland. Um, can, yeah. can you see my, my video? Yes, we can. All right. And, and Permanent Secretary Ajwad, I see you are on as well. Are we able to hear you? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Can you can you hear me now? We can. Yes. Thanks so much for joining. That's great. Yeah. Appreciate it. So, uh, so I will be back in about 20 minutes. Yeah. Yes. That sounds that sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you very much. We'll we'll start here again in a few minutes. panel that we'll be moving into is one on many needs and many storage solutions. And as I noted earlier, this will be our chance to really dive into um, some of the issues that were raised in the keynote uh, speech from Dr. Juk and some of the opening um, opening remarks. And we have a panel of uh, leading experts from, from Bloomberg, from NREL, from IRENA, uh, from the Republic of the, the Maldives. And this will be a session that is moderated um, by Daniel Morris from the Climate Climate Investment Funds. Before we go into the panel though, I do just wanna uh, see what kind of storage people were able to identify during during the break. Maybe we can move to the, move to the next slide. And the next one. Yes, so in Slido, uh, hopefully folks are still in there from, uh, from earlier in the day. You should have a poll popping up on your screen asking what storage did you find and what does it store? And there's the opportunity there to be able to respond and uh, tell us what you identified during your, uh, during your break that provides some form of, of storage and a question about what it stores. All right, great, we're starting to see some things coming in. So far, coffee is the leader. Fantastic, hopefully people are seeing this emerge on, on the screen as, uh, as people come back from, from the break. <laughs> I do like the response about someone's four-year-old charging up at night and being fully powered all day. I'm sure that's quite relevant to many folks who are participating, participating today. And soil, batteries for computers, water bottles, water glasses. I think we're getting some indication of different beverages in different time zones and what's appropriate. Great. Well, thank you everybody for uh, for doing that. I would say keep it coming. Uh, we're very interested in what people were were able able to find. And I and and part of the point here, and I think this sets us up for the for the panel that follows, is storage is really relevant for what it is that is being stored. Um, so whether it's water, whether it's knowledge in books, whether it's the hand sanitizer that people are identifying um, right now, that that storage uh, is is intrinsically tied 
to what it's storing. And a lot of what we're going to be talking about in this next panel and really throughout this event is that relationship between energy storage and the energy that is being stored, in particular clean energy, uh, to be able to support the clean energy transitions that many countries are, um, you know, are embarking on and the critical role that energy plays. So let's keep in mind both the storage and what the storage is storing. And thank you all for uh, for doing that during the break. At this point, uh, maybe we go to the next slide and um, head into the next session. All right. Um, so I will turn it over uh, to uh, Daniel Morris with the Climate Investment Funds. And uh, Danny, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and the theme of this, this panel, um, and then we'll move into presentations from the panelists. Thank you very much, Tom. Appreciate it. Uh, welcome, everyone. Nice to see you all today, and thank you for joining us in this first event of the Global Energy Storage Program Learning Platform. Um, you've heard a lot of good stuff today. Uh, by the way, I'm Danny Morris. I am the uh, program lead for the Global Energy Storage Program, which is part of the Clean Technology Fund housed in the Climate Investment Funds. Uh, I've been in this position for a little over a year, but have been working with the SIFs for a large part of my career and really know and appreciate the, the powerful uh, things that can be done with, with our financing. And we hope to bear that uh, on the energy storage um, sector with this program. You've heard, you heard earlier from Mafalda about our program and what we're trying to do with it, how it complements some initiatives at the World Bank, and we'll get into uh, some experiences we have with other development banks as well later on today. Um, but I think this panel is really um, very complementary to what we've heard so far, especially from um, Imre Juk's presentation, which was excellent and really did an excellent job of explaining where we've been and where we can go with respect to energy storage. What we want to do with this panel is, is ground as much as we can where we are now. And many of you, all of you are very involved in this field. You have a good sense of where things are and what's happening in maybe your neck of the woods or your area of the world. What we're gonna try to do is present a more holistic picture of best we can, a snapshot of where things stand with respect to energy storage today and use that to set up conversations for the rest of the day, tomorrow and uh, through the rest of the year as we continue this learning platform. So um, you, we're going to hear from a number of speakers. We're going to first hear from Yeyoy Sakin, who is the head of uh, decentralized energy at Bloomberg New Energy Finance. I will allow all the panelists to, in, to introduce themselves and, and give their own bios because they are much better at it than I am. Um, but Yeyoy is going to talk to us, give us a, a sense of where things stand with respect to global markets and energy storage today and, and what technologies are moving, what cost curves are doing, and give us a sense of, of where things stand in the field. We'll then turn to Nate Blair, who is a group manager for distributed systems and storage analysis at the National Renewable Energy Lab here in the US, which is based in Colorado. And Nate is going to give a sense of the possible now. I think going over different types of technologies that have applications in developing countries. And if, uh, if a developing country is sort of looking to get in the storage game, what's the realm of possibilities for them and what sort of technologies and considerations could they have to do that? We'll then go to Roland Roche, who is the Deputy Director for Innovation and Technology Center at ARENA. And I think what Roland is gonna present us with is basically the, um, the value assessment of uh, energy of storage in country and sort of how you can sync uh, techno technological solutions with policy solutions to really get it deployed on the ground. And then we will turn to Ajwad Mustafa, who is the permanent, permanent secretary for the Ministry of the Environment at the Republic of Maldives. And he's going to bring it all together for us by explaining the uh, approach that his country has taken uh, in trying to use energy storage as a solution to uh, reliance on diesel generation and this, the, the unique issues that a country, a uh, SIDS country, a small island developing state faces 
with respect to distributed generation and needs for um, uh, storage over the course of the day. So a great panel, lots of good stuff. And I don't want to deny you the pleasure of hearing from our experts anymore. So I turn it over to Yayoi, please take it away. Great, of course, thank you. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Um, I will share my screen because we're all asked to share a couple of um, slides ahead of our presentation, um, which I guess in this in this session, which is titled The Spectacular Energy Storage Growth, is very much about contextualizing the fact that we are just at the beginning of a, a very spectacular growth. Um, my name is, as Daniel has, has introduced, is Yayoi Sekini. I lead the Decentralized Energy Research Group here at Bloomberg NEF, which is one of the research groups focused on what, what it means to have a more decentralized power system, um, which is essentially a very core part of what energy storage is enabling, um, having more distributed decentralized solutions, and, and at the heart of that is understanding um, applications and drivers for energy storage. So uh, moving on to the next slide, um, just to give you some context, um, this is just over the past 10 years and the next three years. Um, and what you're seeing here is the spectacular growth that has happened so far up to 2020. So we have seen a record year in 2020, despite the pandemic, um, there was about 5.3 gigawatts globally. We're actually revising some of the numbers. There was a bit more than that um, over the course of 2020, about 11 gigawatt hours of storage capacity installed on the stationary storage front. This excludes pumped hydro technologies, which, um, which could add quite a bit more. But essentially what we see is that the market continue to grow. Um, what you see is the stacked values across the different regions that we, we track. Essentially, um, it's kind of a story of three major, major markets, which are the US, Europe, and China, um, really um, represents a big portion of the total stack in 2020 and will continue to be major markets through to 2023. So I think it's, it's quite it's quite important for us to get the context of, yes, historically to up to 2020, spectacular growth, um, but it's really just the beginning of this hockey stick. And so 2021, as you can see, our expectation is the, that the market is quite almost, almost doubling over the course of, you know, from 2020 to 2021. And that growth is going to continue to happen across major markets over the coming three years. Um, two years that we have in this forecast. Um, and just to give some more context on to the next slide uh, of what that, this looks like looks like from an, um, an application or segment standpoint, um, essentially a lot of what's driving the, the kind of the ramp up in growth is utility scale storage build. Um, so what you see there is like the solid shaded bars here represents essentially what we expect in terms of the utility scale build. Um, which uh, I guess grew as a proportion in 2020, if you look compared to 2018 and 2019, and that proportion increasingly grows over the course of the next two years. Um, it kind of overshadows some of the interesting dynamics that we do see in the commercial and residential fronts. In particular, residential had also been a, a record year in 2020. A lot of people were staying home at home. A lot of people were concerned about resiliency, which was a major driver for residential energy storage. Um, that's also a major trend that we're seeing. We're expecting to see more customer-sided solutions and storage systems be implemented over the coming, coming years as well. Um, and I guess onto the next slide, what's really driving all of this is the story around prices and costs. Um, so this is a simplified version of a lot of work and analysis that our team does to kind of collect what is the, the prices for lithium ion batteries. Um, we've been doing this for over the course of the last 10 years, I guess 11 years with 2020, um, which essentially has fallen about 90% over this period. Um, which is amazing. It's really a story about, um, about costs coming down and that really is helping support a significant amount of new economic builds, both, um, both in the stationary storage space, but this actually, this chart shows what we call volume weighted average, which is representative of all of the sectors that we were tracking, which includes transportation to electric vehicles, as well as stationary storage. So at the end of 2020, we saw a big volume weighted average of $137 per kilowatt hour for battery, um, battery packs, lithium ion battery packs, um, which was a drop of 13% over from 2019. 
Um, and going on to the next slide, um, we what we tried to do is try to infer what that would what that actually means in terms of how it will translate to prices in the future to help us understand how much more energy storage can be um, unlocked as prices come down how much more electric vehicle uptake might, might we expect um, and essentially that's the dotted line you see in this chart here um, by 2024 we are talking about a volume weighted uh, average price of below hundred dollars per kilowatt hour which kind of passes that benchmark $100 per kilowatt hour, which on the, in the electric vehicle industry really, really um, exemplifies where electric cars can become cost competitive upfront against conventional um, in, in internal combustion engine cars. So really we are talking about, um, about batteries, this being the, 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 the decade of the batteries. Um, and in particular, lithium-ion batteries, which we're talking about a lot today. I know the context of the, the work that um, the Climate Investment Funds is looking at is looking at alternative technologies, but we do want to kind of give that context about what is really driving a lot of the, the price declines in the lithium battery space. Um, and that caused further declines over the coming decade and coming 15 years um, as far as our, our forecast goes. Um, we do this inference of prices by looking at how much prices have dropped as a function of volume. They've dropped about 18% every time we have a doubling of, of battery demand. Um, and that's how, how we're looking at forward prices. That's how we, we reach that $92 by 2024. Um, and just to go on to the next slide, um, in the context of what the, this means for renewables and storage, um, what we've seen is essentially, okay, so this chart here, which is very colorful and bubbly and it's great to kind of demonstrate um, visuals with data, um, but essentially what this does show is you in the US power, like power purchase prices across renewable technologies. So wind and blue, each one of these bubbles represents a PPA in, um, in the US. Um, yellow in, um, yellow representing solar, and then the circled red, yellow, um, that's the solar and storage PPAs. Um, that's essentially the, how, how, I, um, how I like to place it. Back, back in 2017, those PPAs were very exciting and they were quite high in terms of prices. Um, if we go to the next slide, we're actually really talking about these um, these being kind of the new PPAs that are being signed today, um, which are really looking at um, at a smaller premium to an existing solar PPA. Um, so these are really what's the new exciting things and they're really being unlocked by the fact that battery prices have been falling significantly enabling more, um, more um, economic opportunities for solar and storage. Um, and I think the next slide just gives some context in terms of the ranges. So if you can move on one more, thank you. Um, yeah, I guess we can we can go into this and just to, just to give you some context that yes, PPAs prices have been coming down. They're just about at a, a bit of a premium to solar PPAs. Obviously, this really simplifies the fact that battery sizes really matter when you look at prices for PPAs. Um, what the, the what this slide here shows is just examples of auctions in a couple of markets where we've seen for the first time markets contract um, solar and storage PPAs. In the left, that's Israel. Um, they have a very ambitious targets to add a lot of solar into into pretty isolated grid, um, which really really means that they have to start thinking about the flexibility of how to kind of deliver that solar to the grid. And last year, they did help. They did hold um, their first solar and stored off. Sorry, solar and storage auctions, um, which contracted about 2.2 gigawatts of um, of storage capacity. Um, and that's really incredible. On the right-hand side, similarly, Portugal hosted its first solar and storage um, auction, um, in, actually solar auction that allowed storage um, to be bid into. And actually we saw about 72% of contracts adding storage to them and clearing that market there. And so I think what I wanted to show showcase here is the fact that we're really seeing um, kind of the transition of a renewables a historically renewable market to a, a really a current renewables and storage market. And we're gonna expect, we expect that to be more and more of the norm. And so the next, the last slide and the next slide 
um, is essentially just to give you context. That is a story, one part of the story that we expect to continue to see major markets. Um, we forecast this across 40 major markets in the world, and it's just a story of spectacular growth. So we do expect the market to reach almost to um, two terawatts by 2050, or it's one of the outlooks, and that's translating into about um, into about at least like a trillion dollars in terms of investment over the coming decades. Um, and I'll conclude there so that we can pass it on to Nate um, to give some context on the technology front as well. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Right. <clears throat> Thanks, Yayo. Really uh, interesting, very cool examples uh, showing the growth um, of usage and the declining costs in developed countries. And I think something that we've heard so far today is learning from where it's been done in the U.S. and other developed countries and really figuring out how to apply those lessons to a developing country context, which is really not that far behind. Um, and so with that in mind, we turn to Nate Blair uh, at NREL to sort of share some of the technology lessons that, that, is, that have been learned here in the U.S. And, and how developing countries can begin to apply those. Nate, take it away. Sure, thanks. Um, and uh, we're kind of limited to about five slides, so I'm happy to talk for hours uh, on these topics. But I wanted to uh, point uh, to, to kind of help set the stage for some of the technology discussion. Um, I wanted to point to some results that we have from an ongoing project that I'm leading called the Storage Futures Study. Um, and granted, it is kind of US focused, but I think some of the conclusions are uh, generally applicable in any country. Uh, and uh, I'd like to uh, thank Emory for his talk because I think it also kind of leads into some of these technology issues as to where we are and where we may be going uh, in the future. Um, so next slide, please. So within our uh, broader storage future study, we've released a report called the four phases of storage deployment, which um, again is the national potential column here is US focused, but I think that um, uh, a number of these general or uh, a number of these factors are generally applicable, right? So I think at least in the US and in a lot of developing countries, we've got uh, an existing amount of energy storage, particularly in pumped hydro storage. We are now kind of in this zone and, and uh, Emery talked about this as well, where operating reserves are providing a lot of the business case for storage. Um, in the end, we see this as going to be a relatively small market. So 30 gigawatts sounds perhaps really large, but if you look at the at this uh, following phases, um, they're much larger than that. And um, so operating reserves, and that continues to grow, particularly as we've got changes to the mix of, of legacy uh, generators in the US. And then we start to see peaking capacity, and, and I don't have time to talk about it today, but this is very strongly related to solar deployment. As solar comes in, and Emory showed the duck curve that shows the narrowing of the peaks, and the narrowing of the peaks in the afternoon really can, uh, can make it advantageous for short duration or two to four hour, et cetera, uh, batteries. And then the third one is where we've got diurnal capacity and energy time shifting. And we see this as again, tied very closely to very cheap solar, which is a global phenomena uh, and much cheaper batteries. And the two of them working together as an as a economic optimum from anywhere in almost the four to, to larger range, uh, you know, maybe up to 12 hours, but probably not with batteries. And I'll show a little bit more there. And then, Kind of this final phase is what do we do with these several hundreds of hours in the year where uh, we've got um, issues around solar, we've got the sun's not shining, the wind's not blowing, et cetera. Um, and you know, where, where do we wanna deal with that? Where do we wanna get the capacity from? 
uh, in those uh, days and months. Um, so this could be multi-data seasonal capacity, energy time shifting. And I think even in the US, we're still sorting out what that fourth phase is gonna look like, how large it's gonna be, um, and when it's going to arrive. So we see these as phases as uh, overlapping, but somewhat sequential. So um, next slide, please. With that backdrop, um, as part of our efforts, we have looked at uh, and gathered data on a lot of technologies. Um, and uh, there, as, as Emery also alluded to, there are a number of different technologies. Um, lithium ion batteries is obviously the one that, um, that we were just hearing about, and I think is the one that uh, we'll see has, has a cost advantage at the moment. Uh, but as we go to, as we have a need in the system for longer and longer duration storage, um, some of these other technologies could hold sway. Uh, and then a number of them are emerging. Um, so we've got liquid air energy storage, for example. There's a, a couple of uh, high profile companies that are building out new technologies and building out pilot plants and working to reduce cost. Um, and I think uh, it's an open question as to how low these costs can get um, and are they going to run into uh, um, boundaries in terms of manufacturing, uh, in terms of scale, uh, et cetera. And so I think um, that's something we at the national laboratories are looking at pretty heavily as well. Next slide. Okay, so I have two slides where I'm, I'm trying to sort of tell a story. Um, and so on this graphic, you can see a number of technologies are plotted. Uh, big blue dots to indicate cost uncertainty uh, across all of the technologies, uh, even in the ones that have a larger market and a more established uh, manufacturing base, they still have a lot of uncertainty as to uh, and range in terms of what those costs are even today. Um, so across the bottom, you see capital cost as a function of energy, so dollars per kilowatt hour. And then you combine that with the vertical axis, which is just dollars per kilowatt. So there's a capacity component and what I would call a kilowatt hour or duration component. Um, and, uh, and we'll see a little more about duration in the next slide, but you can see these, these technologies that lie across the bottom. Um, they're relatively cheap as a function of power. So if you wanna build a 100 megawatt uh, um, storage system with one hour of storage or less, you might wanna be thinking about um, a, a lithium ion battery because it's at the left end there. But any of these kind of along that horizontal axis are probably more likely. If you wanna build something that uh, maybe is 100 megawatts, but has 100 hours of storage, then you wanna be thinking about those things on the vertical axis. So we've got compressed air energy storage or Ks, we've got pump storage hydro or PSH, um, the hydrogen stored in a cavern and then pushed through a fuel cell um, or combined cycle plant in the future could, um, could reach prices that are in that range as well, that current prices are, are higher. Um, and so you can see that's kind of the breakdown. And so where, depending on your use case, you could end up with a really uh, wide range of technologies that might be the optimum. Next slide, please. The other thing, and, and I appreciate, uh, the NEFs uh, lead into this because uh, the other part that we're coming at is looking at a deeper dive on costs for uh, lithium ion batteries. This is our mid case for costs. We also have an advanced case and a, um, uh, and a case with less uh, improvement in cost. Um, what I wanted to point out was the graph on the right. So this is the total installed capital cost in dollars per kilowatt. Um, and as you can see, because the price of the battery pack keeps coming down, and Emory did a good job of talking about the balance of system cost versus the battery component cost, 
as the component costs and the battery pack costs keep coming down, you can see that in the future as we get towards 2050, the range in costs between a two hour battery, a four hour battery or a 10 hour battery really decreases significantly. And so you, you get to the point where say that battery pack was free, all those costs are gonna be the same or roughly the same because you've got the permitting costs, et cetera, the project development costs, the installation costs and so forth. And so I think that's an interesting finding where as we, as we go into the future, some it might be that, oh, we think we need a two hour battery for our uh, grid. Let's go ahead and maybe build a four hour battery to reduce uncertainty. Um, so I think as we, as we go into the future, some of those questions that are really vexing at the moment as to how much storage we need could uh, be alleviated as we go forward. Next slide, please. And then lastly, um, this is a, a nice uh, graph also coming out of our work where we look at hours of duration across the bottom and then the total capital costs in dollars per kilowatt. Uh, so as you buy more and more, then you look across the bottom to see what the duration is. And as you can see, uh, most of these technologies, as you buy uh, more, a larger duration, the cost per kilowatt or the cost per power out uh, continues to increase. Some of these lines are very flat. So if you look at the hydrogen line for 2020 up there on the right, uh, it's quite high um, and, uh, um, and it continues, but the uh, anticipated uh, reductions in um, uh, hydrogen electrolyzer costs, for example, and so on and so forth, can get them down, hopefully, into the future down here towards the bottom and below kind of current lithium ion battery costs. The other thing I'd point out is that I've plotted on here the lithium ion battery or LIB cost for 2019, 2020, 2022, and the lowest red line there is 2024, so to give you the impression that this continues to march downward as we go into the future. And so, um, so you can see this is where the excitement comes from for lithium ion batteries versus some of these other technologies. And again, any one of these emerging technologies or some of these other technologies uh, with scale could reduce costs uh, unexpectedly and dramatically. Um, and, and become um, more of a uh, market choice uh, in the future. So uh, next slide, I think that might be the last one. Yep, thank you. Great, thanks Nate, excellent presentation. I mean, clearly there is a huge menu of technology options out there and it's also quite clear that you could talk about this for hours and hours and I'm sure many uh, audience members would be interested in that, but we must march on. Um, I think uh, this conversation is really interesting, and I think it's important to recognize the context in which we're having it, which is not just that energy storage is a useful solution for energy systems across the globe, but that we're trying to achieve something with respect to emissions reductions and in, in tackling climate change to the extent we can, right? So it's good to talk about the different services that energy storage can provide, but the one that I always keep in the back of my mind is the year 2030. And specifically, we've been told by scientists we have until 2030 to get the world on a zero carbon path. And energy storage is a big part of that. And so as different uh, decision makers in country think about how to get there, um, really articulating the value proposition of energy storage becomes very important. So with that in mind, we turn to Roland um, to present from his perspective in ARENA sort of what the value proposition of storage is and how it fits in situ in country. Roland, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks a lot uh, for the, the introduction, Daniel. Also thanks to the Climate Investment Fund and to Ross Strategic to invite here the International Renewable Energy Agency. International Renewable Energy Agency is by, mandated by 162 member countries as the agency that uh, accelerates the deployment of renewable energies. 
And uh, also we have a mandate as the, as the Global Energy Transition Agency. And this is why uh, specifically electricity storage has a very big importance for us as an agency as being one of the enabling technologies of the energy transition to integrate higher shares of, of variable renewables. So renewable energy technologies have expanded rapidly in the recent years because of steep cost reduction in, in innovation and policy support. And let's say when you come uh, to levels of 30% uh, renewables, renewable power in your system. And we have looked in, into this on, on islands, but also in integrated systems, so beyond 30% of a, a renewable a share of variable renewable, you need as support uh, storage or at least other flexibility mechanisms. The next slide, please. And let's say storage is of course one of the, the, the possibilities that you can use uh, in, in bringing flexibility to your system. Solar, wind and power are variable and uncertain affecting system operation at various timescales. Such set of solution is needed to support system flexibility. So electricity storage can provide a wide range of services that support solar and wind integration and address some of the new challenges that the variability uncertainty of solar wind introduced to the power system. In a market setting, when allowed to participate in the wholesale market, storage can consume or feed in electricity in response to price signals, in particular increasing demand when prices are very low or even negative. While negative prices could be a sign of inflexibility in the system, storage can prevent such phenomena from happening by consuming electricity and being paid to do so. And let's say you see here on this slide, let's say what, what you can achieve with storage. So it can bring inertia to the system, specifically in systems where you have a lot of uh, photovoltaic inertia is, is uh, very often missing where you have um, kind of heavy rotating machines in the system. Also fast frequency response to, uh, to stabilize the frequency in the system is very important to operate a secure system. Operational reserves, let's say if there is a kind of deviations in the forecasting or if some of the, the generation in the system is collapsing, you need these operational reserves that can come from storage. And then of course, you have the load following and the time shifting in a system with variable renewables, where the wind blows and, and sometimes doesn't blow, you have to make very precise forecasts. And if these forecasts are, are delayed, so if, if, if the, the forecast, is, is different, you come into a situation where your system can collapse and their storage is extremely important. And so let's say you see here, let's say that storage co-located with vari variable renewables can have direct benefits. So it increases the firm capacity that you have. So you have basically a base load system. If you combine storage with um, the, the, the generators, it, it reduces the variability and the uncertainty in the system, which is extremely important. On standalone storage, um, you reduce operational impacts of variable renewables and it defers need on other investments. So that means if you need uh, extremely uh, to invest in additional generation capacities because to, to deal with the peak capacity, you can make savings here while you have um, good storage in the system. The same applies for efficiency uh, uh, and let's say using and operate the grid in an efficient way that reduces those investments. So just from what I explained here, you see that storage 
has a lot of value, value to bring into the system. And also um, Dr. Giok explained about the social benefits that come from storage. But if you are a developer in a developing country of a single storage capacity, many of the aspects the storage can bring into the system can in a complexer system kind of not so evaluated project by project. You have to look at to the full aspects of an integrated horizontal system. And let's say this, this integrated approach of storage is also ne necessary to basically have an amortization of these investments. And this is very important to understand. And that's why IRENA created the, the storage evaluation framework. Can I see my next slide? Um, yeah, in this next slide, you see the different objectives of the framework. So what kind of services can storage provide to help to integrate more variable renewable in the power system? So the, the services that you require are very important. Next one, to understand those services. Next, uh, next uh, slide or next tick, please. Yes, then the technologies. So which technologies, which storage technologies are available? And, and there it, it's, it's very clear, um, let's say offering grid services like uh, provisions of primary and secondary reserves, as well as firm capacity. There you have to look in, uh, let's say the different storages that are available. And let's say different storage technologies are intrinsically more suited to providing certain services rather than others. For instance, batteries have, have proven to be very rapid in responding to signals, um, let's say, uh, to that come and set points from system operation. This is very important. If you, um, let's say, look into large volumes and you want to balance uh, your energy in the system in the longer term, then uh, large volumes of electricity need to be shifted. And let's say this can be done best done with, uh, with pumped hydro. And historically, uh, pumped hydro has been the main technology to achieve this. Pumped hydro may therefore see a renaissance in markets where you have solar and wind dominating the power system. And let's say if you have an understanding of the technologies, you have to make a comparison with other resources of flexibility in your system. So there is, for instance, uh, let's say gas turbines based on, 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 on bio gas and, and, and gaseous fuels can be used also to, to balance the system. Ocean energies, as far as they are applicable, can help to balance your system, but also geothermal energy or hydro generation in general can help you to, to deal with the flexibility challenges. And you have to weigh up what is best, either bringing other elements of flexibility in or you go for storage. And let's say to look for these services you need exactly, and then to balance between the flexibility possibilities you have and to place the storage. This is what the IRENA um, evaluation framework is, is helping you with. And this is specifically important also in developing countries where you have not fully uh, shaped and integrated big systems with, with many, many aspects. Please, the next slide. Um, so um, here you see the, the way the electricity storage valuation framework is, is is working and you can download this, um, this um, report and how to use this evaluation um, uh, framework for to evaluate the value of your storage. You can find it on the IRENA web page under www.irena.org and they're in the publications or if you, you Google uh, basically the, the electricity storage valuation framework. So first, you identify the electricity storage services 
to support the integration for variable renewables. And then it is very important that you do a mapping of the storage technologies which are identified with the identified services to make sure this is the type of storage you need for the services you, that you need in your system to have a, a proper understanding there. This is very important. And then as explained earlier, you have to analyze the system value of the electricity storage compared to the other flexibility options you have in the system. And then you need to run a simulation of the operation uh, to, to understand, let's say, the, the stacking of, of revenues and the costs you have and how this can be best achieved. And then assess the viability of this uh, specific storage project. So let's say to have this broader approach in assessing what you need and what services your storage brings to the system is extremely important because you are likely going to fail if you do a project by project case evaluation of your, uh, let's say the storage you want to uh, integrate into the system because usually the regulation and the policy in place does not help you to make a project based um, um, kind of um, uh, project that you can amortize just project by project case wise. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yes. So important for the recommendations is here um, electricity for electricity storage developers. So get familiar with the existing business models and collaborate closely with the regulators and with the utility to make sure everybody understands the value you bring to the entire system with your storage, um, with the storage you want to send up in the system. Uh, let's say for the vertically, uh, vertically integrated utilities, it is important to update planning tools and include energy storage and update the procurement process for services required and not just pick a technology. So it means in the possibility of your vertically integrated utility, you have to look at all levels in what kind of technology, uh, storage technology you need to satisfy, let's say the requirements on all levels. The next, uh, next part of this slide, please. Oh, next, yes, for regulators, it is very important that regulators understand that they have to eliminate the, barri the barriers for electricity st storage so that the market can work and that it is possible to incorporate, uh, let's say, electricity storage based on least cost planning. For the research community, let's say what we find out and found out at IRENA, there is a lot of need to develop uh, analytical tools so analytical tools that support the further development of tools and methodology to perform energy storage valuation. And let's say tools that help to develop scenarios to uh, let's say study the benefits. So the integrated benefits, including the socioeconomic benefits that come from electricity storage. And the next slide, that is my, yes. Here are two cases, um, and let's say it's basically the same case in looking into the role of, um, let's say, the energy markets and doing an arbitrage uh, for a variable renewable energy integration of a wind park. So let's say if the wind is flowing and you are producing more electricity in the system as, as you, you need, you can charge. And then let's say in the time when more electricity is needed in the entire system, you basically can uh, discharge uh, the electricity you have stored. Very important, this is a case from an Australian project uh, from 2017 with 229 megawatt hour uh, of the, the, the capacity. So it can discharge 100 megawatt and then it can charge uh, 80 megawatt um, in the system. 
And here, let's say it's it's very important to say this worked. Let's say it is a, is a unique thing where the, there is a, a, a margin between the discharging and charging of 91 Australian dollar that helps. But also in this case, very important to understand only the arbitrage business is not enough to make this work. And also, let's say the contingency frequency control and providing ancillary services was needed to make this, um, this um, project here kind of financially and commercially feasible. Next and my last slide. My last, my last slide, please. Uh, now we can jump over this. I think Yaoji has spoken about this. Also, Irina sees that the costs for um, uh, storage capacity in the market is coming down. We also expect because of the scale uh, scaling up that more storage is needed. The cost will come more down and we will see a, a lot more storage integration into electricity system in the years to 2030 and then till 2050 because it just requires the scaling up of electricity storage like batteries in the system. So that was a point that already the, the George Roy from uh, Bloomberg New Energy has uh, said. So for me to, to summarize here, electricity store supports the variable renewable integration and its large scale deployment. And let's say the, the, this can provide considerable benefits of the power system and the society in general. Very important what Dr. Gayuk uh, said is to look into the social benefits that also comes from, from electricity storage is, is key to make sure that electricity storage can bring its benefits to all aspects, uh, the, the storage, the system integration and to socioeconomics. Electricity storage deployment will only happen if the missing money, so the gap that I described between the single project uh, that you have and that you calculate and the integrated approach in looking at all aspects that electricity storage brings as value to the integrated system is very important. Uh, bridging this missing money requires in looking and discussing about the regulatory restructuring and also to bring policy support uh, to be based on the results of techno-economic analysis to assess costs and benefits of electricity storage. IRENA is providing to its uh, the policymaker of its member countries this uh, this uh, this aspect. I finalize my my presentation here you and hand to over to Daniel Morris. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, thank you, Roland. Appreciate that. It was um, great content, and I think an important message that comes out is that while the cost of technology is important, it is certainly not the only consideration. So. Let us now turn um, to someone who has dealt with all these problems and can help us sort of understand what happens when you try to deploy energy storage on the ground. Um, we're really glad to have with us um, Ajwad Mustafa and Maldives are in the midst of, of a transition right now using energy storage. So Ajwad, please, please take it away. Share your experiences with us. Um, thank you, uh, Daniel. Uh, First of all, let me thank uh, CIF for, for giving me this opportunity to speak in this important uh, platform. As, as you have rightly said, um, Maldives has a very ambitious renewable energy program. But as I speak right now, we are, like the rest of the world, we are in a very difficult situation due to the COVID pandemic, you know, since 2019, uh, it has significantly impacted our economy and, and since we are a tourism based destination, you know, once the international borders are closed, it, it co completely, you know, stops the revenue source for, for a country like Maldives. So, but even in this difficult uh, climate, you know, um, situation, the government of Maldives has, uh, you know, announced very ambitious targets in as part of our contribution to 
uh, under Paris Agreement. You know, we are one of the few countries. You know, in fact, one of and for countries that have you know actually pledged to go net zero by 2030, whereas the rest of the world has a pledge to be uh, net zero by 2050. You know, from a, for a small country like Maldives, you know, to be this ambitious comes with a huge challenge. You know, but being a country in the forefront of climate change, being a country with, with you know, we, we, you know, most vulnerable to the impacts of the climate change. We feel we have the moral obligation, you know, to demonstrate to the world that, you know, we can be resilient, you know, we can um, be sustainable in our development and we can produce energy using alternative means. Uh, more, we can be more renewable, you know, dependent. But this is uh, inevitable for a country like Maldives because at the moment, we are entirely, almost entirely dependent on imported fossil fuel for power generation and, and transport. Because of the nature of our islands, you know, the geographic dispersion of our islands, inter-island transport consumes a lot of energy. And each island has its own powerhouse uh, mini grid. Again, uh, requires, you know, um, power generation at the source of the island, you know. So this is same for all the tourist islands that we have. You know, each island has its own um, powerhouse, mini grid, and other facilities. The, it is not a landlocked country. So with it comes a lot of challenge. But with it comes a lot of opportunities as well, especially in the context of uh, renewable energy. You know, uh, Most of our islands, the demand for electricity is not that large. You know. In some islands, it's it's the range of within thousands of you know hundreds of kilowatt you know. Rarely there are islands with with megawatt scale in, in demand. So, but because of is is dispersion because of the numbers that we have to deal with in terms of converting you know it, it becomes a challenge. When we look at the you know as I said um, we are predominantly you know dependent on import of um, fuel. Uh, we spend almost about about 10% of our GDP on importing fossil fuel, and 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 because of that, you know, because of small scale generations that are required, you know, that the cost of producing electricity is very high using conventional uh, diesel fuel. Uh, we have one of the highest electric retail tariffs in the region, and to make it affordable, the government is having to subsidize a huge sums from our our national budget. You know, so. You know, because of these reasons, because of our climate obligations, the government has announced to be uh, net zero by 2030, provided that we get the international support, um, support from platforms like Climate Investment Fund, you know, multil multilateral banks like um, World Bank and A ADB and other, other international banks. And fortunately for us, uh, we are getting that support. We are one of the first few countries, you know, to be selected uh, to be piloted, you know, renewable energy projects under the climate investment funds. And through that the funds, through the support of um, World Bank and ADB, we have been, you know, running our renewable energy initiatives. And we have done it quite successfully as well. And when we started, you know, the price of uh, kilowatt hour um, was a, a, the first sub project that we floated. Um, through the CIF with, with support from additional support from World Bank, uh, the project called uh, Accelerating Sustainable Private Investments in Renewable Energy, ESPIRE. Under that, you know, the first sub project we launched, uh, we got an elect um, tariff rate of about 21 cents. But fortunately, uh, as, as other speakers have said, you know, the technology prices are going down. And, and we have benefited from that. And the most recent tenders that we floated under the Aspire program, the five megawatt project, uh, that we have got actually a retail tariff of 10.9 um, cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, you know, which according to our figures, this is one of the you know uh, the, the, the the smallest you know, uh, tariff rate for any small island developing country uh, comparable to Maldives. So. We feel this is a huge achievement and which one which we can replicate in other other small island developing state as well. Again, um, when we started this, you know, initiatives, the I would call it the adventure, if you like, you know, um, 
we were thinking in terms of few kilowatts hours, you know, few kilowatts of um, solar PV installation, you know. Really, it goes about, you know, 100 kilowatts, you know. But now, because the technology prices have gone down, uh, because the battery storage, the uh, technologies have evolved and the prices have gone down, we are now thinking in terms of utility scale projects, you know, we are, term, we are not now no longer talking in kilowatts, but we are talking in megawatts. The, the new projects that we are floating with the support from uh, the World Bank and other donors ranges in, in the range of 10 megawatts to 30, 50 megawatts, you know. And we are also um, going ahead planning a, a huge utility scale floating solar projects in the ocean. So, um, so again, I would like to you know put my focus on a particular project that we, we are doing with uh, the World Bank through the World Bank uh, led Sustainable Renewable Energy Risk Mitigation Initiative as RMI initiative. The mold is so again a dramatic reduction in the prices uh, as I have explained before. Uh, and through the success of this project, we have formulated another project uh, which is called um, Accelerating Renewable Energy Integration and Sustainable Energy Arise. You know, former project was Aspire. These are very catchy names. <laughs> uh, now the new project is called Arise. Uh, under this project, you know, uh, we are seriously thinking of uh, going for for battery energy storage systems in a, in a big way. Uh, so we have already selected uh, islands where we are going to install, you know, battery energy storage systems to ensure reliability of supply and 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 to make the, the whole uh, system more cost efficient. Um, under this project, we'll be installing about approximately 50 megawatt hour battery energy storage systems in selected islands. Uh, partly, this will be used for, as an ancillary service for load shifting, other 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 benefits that comes with it. Mm. And we feel, you know, the investment climate in the renewable energy sector in the Maldives has improved through a robust risk mitigation package, as well as the one World Bank Group approach with support from multilateral investment guarantee agency, MEGA, and International Finance Corporation, IFC. And with the COVID-19, it become further important for us at the government of Maldives to focus and attain energy independence sooner than well, that we have actually planned. And we feel with the support from climate investment funds and other donor agencies, we, we, we can achieve that target, you know. And this is all part of our, you know, after COVID, the government has uh, resilience and recovery program. Uh, investment in energy is considered as a high priority because we want to build back, build back better, you know. We don't want to go back when we build back our country after the COVID pandemic, we want to be more sustainable, you know, more, we want to use indigenous resources that we have. We are a country with close to equator with plenty of sunshine. There's ocean surrounding us. We want to explore new technologies. We want to explore the ocean technologies where we want, to, uh, you know, all this can be facilitated, you know, you know, with the support of batteries. One of the key limiting factor for us was, you know, availability of affordable, reliable, you know, battery technology. Now, as, as we have seen in the other presentations, we have that and we have other promising technologies uh, in coming in future. So with that, um, let me conclude my brief remark. Uh, let me once again thank the uh, Climate Investment Fund for, for giving us this opportunity to, to present our case to the audience. Thank you. Great, thank you, Ajwad. Really great to have that, that country perspective and, and understand some of the challenges that you all have faced. Um, we are a little over time, but I'm going to use the moderator's prerogative to extend our conversation a bit because we do wanna have a little Q&A. Recognizing the uh, time constraints of everyone though, I know that for instance, Yeyoy has to leave us at 10.30. And my understanding is that there is uh, at least one Q&A, one question that's come through Slido for her. So 
I might ask um, my colleague, Sarah, do you want to, Sarah, do you want to jump in with that question for Yayoi so she can take a crack at it before she has to leave us? Yeah, um, I can go ahead and ask that now. So the question is, Bloomberg shows incredible growth of storage market, um, usage increasing and cost decreasing rapidly. Is this trend compatible with 2050 goals or is more needed? Yeah, right. Thank you for, for the question. And I'm, I'm very sorry to have to jump. Um, that's a very, very good question. Um, so when, when I presented that last slide in particular, the 2050 outlook with cumulative capacity, I talked about with the trillion dollar investment in, in batteries, that actually shows one scenario of the work that we do to basically model how much battery capacity we expect across different markets. Um, we call it the economic transition scenario. Um, which essentially looks at the least cost way to build a power system based on all generation technologies uh, year on year. Um, and it's looking at basically what is the cheapest way to build that system. Um, and it actually doesn't meet our 2050 needs in terms of what would be needed to fully decarbonize or to reach that 1.5 degrees in there. Um, degree targets and um, essentially we've done additional work to try to see what is the additional investment and additional um, kind of push that we would need from a climate perspective to really reach that goal and essentially I guess what, you, what you'd see there is essentially you need to build a lot more more batteries than, than what we've shown. Um, the reason why we use our economic transition scenario as part of the basis is, is to really show what is economically feasible from a from a um, from an economic standpoint, um, recognizing that obviously policy and regulation has an important role to play in actually realizing the additional potential that's required for us to reach a, a deeper decarbonization pathway. Um, so I hope that gives some context. I'm happy to give additional, um, if you have additional questions, please um, message me and Daniel will have my email and we can follow up offline as well. Awesome. Yeah, you know, I thank you so much for your time. Thanks for the great answer to the question. Um, appreciate you being here with us. Thank you, everyone. It's been great and great presentations. Really love uh, this topic. It's so important. And as Dr. Dr. Jokes has, has said, it's so important that we put everything we, we can now. Um, so this is really, um, I guess, a partly a call to action, but also recognizing there's a lot of action already um, being materialized, a lot to learn. I'm so looking forward to keeping in touch with everyone. And bye. Thank you so much for moderating. Great. Thank you. Um, well, so I do want to extend the opportunity for others to answer questions for about five minutes, five or 10 minutes. Um, so to the audience, those who do want to ask questions, you can pose them either in Slido or here in the chat. But maybe just to get things started, I'll, I'll broadly ask our three remaining panelists to expound on the same, the same idea that, that Yaya was addressing, which is, are the current trends sort of putting us in line to achieve climate goals with respect to 1.5 or two degrees, depending on what you look at by 2050? Or should we think of this as kind of the beginning of an evolution of, of how things are moving? And maybe, um, maybe I'll go in reverse order and, and start with you, Ajwad. Um, do you feel like what we're doing is, is sufficient or is this just the beginning of, of a larger, longer term effort? Uh, I, think, I think to be honest, you know, I think what we are doing may not ever be sufficient compared to, you know, compared to the challenge we have at hand, you know. You know, I know the technology is evolving at a very fast pace and, but still, you know, for a developing country like uh, like Maldives, you know, we need technologies now, you know, because, uh, you know, uh, there are many technologies in ocean related technologies, you know, which we feel if we, if we have it right now, you know, we can be self-sufficient, you know, but there are, there are a lot of things in, in an experimental stage, you know, where we, for a country like us, it is not really affordable, you know, right, right now we are only working with solar and, you know, and, uh, and even batteries, we are only we only have access to lithium ion batteries, you know. So we certainly for a country like small island country like Maldives, what we are doing right now is really not enough. We need to access, access to technologies. We need to access to finance, you know, more. Great, thank you, Roland. What are your thoughts? Uh, of course, uh, let's say maybe just to. Um, 
to follow on, 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 and make comment briefly on what uh, Mr. Mustafa said uh, from, from the Maldives. Of course, an, an island is a specific case, no, there you don't have much possibilities. If you can, let's say, if you have a share of 30% renewables, you can look into the possibility on demand response and, uh, <clears throat> and maybe there's possibilities with ocean, ocean energy, but of course of an, of an atoll in like the Maldives, this would be very difficult. So that leaves you basically with battery storage as a, as a solution to deal with. And, and let's say this is still very expensive if you combine um, um, electricity storage with, with wind energy and, 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 and solar. But let's say also for the islands where, where diesel generation is very expensive, this may be a solution. In a broader sense of what we discussed today, I think it's very important to, to make the point here that storage does not necessarily go only through electrons. So there is uh, also the possibility to look into storage with molecules and the bringing in, especially in countries that have a gas infrastructure in, in place to look into possibilities, how, how uh, gas storage and the current existing gas storage can be used or, or mainly um, if a possibility exists also to do something with hydrogen uh, to decarbonize the system. That can be an additional approach, mainly in, in, in developed countries, there will be more opportunities to take use of uh, storage related to, <clears throat> to molecules. I think very, very inspiring is of course, what we have seen uh, also in the, in the presentation from Yadroy about uh, the, um, the prices and the costs for storage are coming down. And that uh, gives us a lot of opportunities in let's say using electricity storage as an enabling technology to deal with uh, the integration of variable renewables. But also Irina worked on an innovation landscape report about other innovations that look at the possibility to deal with this uh, flexibility and variability challenge coming from variable renewables. And there is a lot more things like the internet of things, digitalization, um, um, just to name a few of these 30 uh, innovations we have identified that help to have a better system in integration. You can find this report as innovation landscape report on the, on the webpage of IRENA. Thanks a lot for having me here. That was a very, very interesting discussion today. And I think it's, it's also a very important topic and storage will become even more important in the years, in the coming years now. Thank you. Great, thanks Roland. Nate, I'll turn it over to you to address the question and maybe help wrap us up. Sure, I'm not sure if I can wrap us up, but I, because it's a distinguished panel, but I'd be happy to address the question a little bit. I, I, I jotted down a couple of things. One is that um, I think the good news is that there are a number of storage options. Um, and I think our efforts are trying to look at optimums and optimum mixtures. And I think as we move and accelerate movement towards this, um, I think people are aware the new US administration has a 2035 goal for electrification of the power sector, uh, which is much more rapid than 2050 uh, and brings into question a number of non technology and non cost issues just in terms of uh, the rapidity of rolling out that level of generation and, and storage. Um, but I think that uh, the, the positive news in all of this is that there are storage solutions um, that are available. I think that uh, um, secondly, uh, that, you know, as, as we move towards a, a 2050 goal, um, we have to take a really comprehensive look and an integrated look. Um, you know, as we, it, we may fix the solar generation so that the ramp rate is ideal for the current load shape, but then the load shape is changing because we're putting tons of EVs on the grid uh, and we're doing a number of other things. And I think from an analyst perspective, 
um, as we move across multiple sectors towards these uh, carbon goals, um, the integration of all of this is really uh, the 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 what's making things tricky uh, from an analysis perspective. Um, do we have solutions that are out there? I think we do. I think as we ramp up and build out a lot of these, um, we're going to see what we're seeing with PV at least, which is that the soft costs. The development costs, the regulatory uh, timelines, um, permitting timelines, et cetera, are what's starting to hold back the deployment much more so than the cost. So, um, you know, that's there's a variety of ways to work on that. But, but I think that aligns with um, what the Maldives is seeing uh, in terms of financing and financing process and financing timelines and and so forth, which is. Well, it's great that CIF is involved here. Yeah, thanks, Nate. Uh, really excellent way to, to um, or a thought for, for people to leave with. One thing that I've really come to appreciate from this discussion is that putting storage into energy systems really can complicate the entire system overall and requires much more active management in many ways. But that's not a bad thing because overall, that is what is required as we move towards electrification of so many sectors in the economy. And um, it can really be sort of a, a building block to help us learn how to, how to manage a grid that you know, eventually we hope will be zero carbon. Um, thank you all very much for this great presentation, this great discussion. Um, we appreciate your insights and, and really look forward to an ongoing discussion with you all. Um, I'll just say thanks to that and turn it back to Tom to set us up for a deep dive in some ongoing projects that are, uh, you know, ready to either being deployed now or ready to be deployed. So thank you all again very much. And Tom, back over to you. Great. All right. Thanks so much, Danny. And and thank you to our, our panelists. Uh, just fascinating set of issues and the depth of knowledge and expertise you you bring to this is is fantastic. And um, we uh, what we want to do now is um, just talk about some of the work that's that's going on around the world um, and in particular focusing in on um, the multilateral development bank investments in several regions of the world in energy storage. And we have kind of a two part approach to this. We're going to start here with what we might think of as kind of the, the taster menu, um, where you'll just get a little bit of a sense of, of some of these projects from those who are leading um, from the multilateral development banks in them. And then we're going to be moving after that um, initial showcase into a set of breakout sessions where there will be more time to hear about these projects specifically and to have um, questions and, and answers. So as we're going through this initial showcase, um, we're really, the intent is to just in a couple of minutes just to, for the presenters to give a flavor of these energy storage projects and also an opportunity for them to pitch you all as attendees to say why you should join them uh, in the breakout sessions that, that follow to hear more about these these projects and to have um, a couple of, of more time, more time for questions. So we'll hear about projects in South Africa. We'll hear about projects in Colombia and Latin America, and we'll hear more about um, projects in the, the Maldives building on what uh, Permanent Secretary Ajwad referenced. We, we also, um, we're hoping to have some focus on a, a energy storage project in Ukraine, um, but due to scheduling issues, we won't be able to do that, but that'll be something we'll look to bring into one of the future interactions. So at this point, um, why don't I turn to uh, Isaac Lemke uh, from the IFC to talk about the South Africa um, energy storage project. And Isaac, uh, just a you know, couple of minutes on the project to give an overview and then an answer to the question of why should people join you in the breakout session? Um, thank you. Uh, thank you. Greetings to, to all the participants and I'd like to thank uh, CIA for the opportunity to give some perspective of the developments in, in South Africa. Um, 
just in short, in, in theory, uh, South Africa has, uh, is quite unique relative to many of the other African countries in that it has a massive uh, generation capacity of 50, 51 gigawatts, big demand of 35. So in theory, everything should look okay. We are, we are dominant, uh, we've got a dominant utility supplying 90% of the capacity. And uh, since 2010, we started small IPP renewal program and were successful with four, four rounds, uh, adding 6,400 megawatts to the grid. Um, however, things do go wrong. Our utility is struggling. They, they've got an aging fleet. The, um, the energy availability factor of the fleet is dropping significantly. And here we sit and we had to, in spite of all the, of the energy master plan, had to announce a risk mitigation program to address a serious shortfall of between four to six gigawatt, uh, suffering from rolling blackouts and, and had to approach the private sector market because the government is, is also struggling on funding. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So government was forced to, to introduce uh, or to test the market on a, on a technology agnostic uh, procurement program. In their minds, clearly thinking about uh, a thermal solution because it was emergency, I had to deploy it quickly. And it was designed very specifically against the, the energy needs, a specific ESCOM, a utility dispatch profile, which uh, started from five in the morning to cover the morning peak and it ran it runs till, till 9.30 a.m. In the, in the evening, covering those two peak hours. So clearly thermal was in mind. And to our big surprise, if we can just go to the next slide. Um, that was, those were the successful bidders. And I'm happy to say that of the 11 successful bidders, uh, we have seven developers that pitched with uh, renewables plus battery storage and some has a small thermal component to it which i'll elaborate more on the next session to to explain that but that is quite surprising and the and you can see the sizes of those projects that ndc stands for net dependable capacity quite significant sizes that we have there and very importantly most of these deals are underpinned by commercial banks so very interesting development almost a surprise to to government uh, and, and we, we sort of look back, the most competitive bit was also the, the aqua tower bit, solar plus battery storage, many lessons to, to learn from this bidding program. We think um, that renewables plus battery storage uh, clearly showed that they can competitively address the electricity supply, uh, dispatch, uh, provide dispatchability, and could also assist in stabilizing the grid. So we are convinced that once, the, once these projects are implemented, we will have a new bench, benchmark for other applications, such as power to mines and, and CNI space, but also for other countries to follow. Uh, and, and that renewables plus battery storage can make a significant contribution to an energy transition to a cleaner, uh, a lower carbon environment. I'll leave it at that if uh, time, time permitting. I'm happy to, to give more, more details in the follow-up session. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. All right, why don't we move to uh, Claudio Alatore from uh, Inter-American Development Bank to talk about work in Colombia and, and Latin America. Um, yes, yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Tom. Um, let me, uh, I will in this session uh, talk about our, uh, one of the projects we are uh, now considering under the Global Energy Storage Program, which is uh, one in uh, Colombia. So if you can move to the next slide. Uh, so the uh, Colombia context is uh, particularly interesting because uh, the uh, energy regulator in Colombia approved a, a resolution uh, recently in 2018 uh, which, and this resolution defines the mechanism to incorporate battery storage systems. Uh, it includes guidelines for project implementation, procurement processes, payment mechanisms, guarantee supervision. Uh, and the first public 
center of the peace resolution uh, seeks to address uh, a problem of capacity and reliability in the city of Barranquilla, in the uh, Caribbean uh, coast of, of uh, Colombia. And this, uh, they published already a tender in January uh, 2021. Uh, uh, this uh, project, uh, which is very innovative in this uh, context, and I think in the whole uh, Latin America, includes a 45 megawatt battery to be connected to a substation. It uh, should be a starting operation in June 2023. Um, the project developer needs, I mean, it's a market mechanism where you have a project developer that will be responsible for securing the land, installing everything, uh, operating maintenance, and actually also the final disposal of the battery. Uh, and there will be an economic uh, payment uh, uh, that will cover a 15-year uh, period. Uh, it's estimated that the total cost of this system will be between 60 and 70 uh, million uh, dollars. Uh, so it, it's the first project, as I was saying, but it is expected that more uh, projects will uh, follow uh, in the future. So we in the IDB uh, with the Global uh, Energy Storage Program, uh, the CTF Resources, uh, we will be supporting a uh, um, uh, finance, a financing facility. Uh, this financing facility is a uh, 90 million facility, including other um, uh, issues such as uh, renewable energy, uh, uh, electric mobility. But we will have a, a specific window focusing on storage with the CTF uh, resources as part of this uh, financing uh, facility. So it's a uh, uh, an interesting case, and thank you. It uh, has been very useful. It will be very useful for us to have these uh, uh, concessional resources to be able to drive this uh, transformation and innovative agenda. Uh, thank you, Tom. Let me finish here, and of course, I can provide more details uh, later. Thank you, Claudio. All right, why don't we move to our, our final uh, showcase, uh, moving around the globe uh, to the Republic of, of Maldives. And uh, I think we have Chong Suk Song and Amit Jain uh, on from the World Bank. Oh, I see you, Amit, go ahead. Yes, thank you very much, uh, everybody. So um, this is the only slide we have. Uh, so the reason we are trying to say is if why you should attend the 30 minute session after this elevator pitch if you want to visit this beautiful country Maldives and this in these pandemic times please do come and visit us in the next 30 minutes. Uh, jokes apart uh, uh, with the World Bank we are implementing one of the largest uh, storage programs in the Maldives uh, as part of the ARISE program. Uh, what we're trying to do over here is uh, Maldives is totally dependent on tourism about 50 to 75% of the GDP and the income comes from tourism. A typical resort in Maldives is about $1,000 a night. And Maldives has been traditionally dependent on this tourism industry to drive its economy. In this COVID, in the last one, one and a half years, it has destroyed its tourism industry and Maldives is suffering from severe economic and financial crisis. So the government asked the, Mal the, the World Bank to look into what could be done to recover uh, in a more sustainable manner in this pandemic times. And we looked into that and we found that diesel payments done by the Maldives governments are one of the major drains on the forex return and obtained by the Maldives government. And diesel goes mostly into transport and into the electricity sector. It is in this background, the government asks us to build a hundred million dollars, one of the largest program World Bank or any multilateral has done in Maldives to move towards sustainable economy and towards green jobs of which storage is an integral component. And we are so thankful to CIF and CTF. We got $30 million, again, one of the largest contributions by SIF in a SIDS country, in a remote country like Maldives, where storage plays much uh, a great role in moving towards a sustainable future. During the pandemic times in the last one year, Maldives has taken three steps. First, it has released a roadmap for storage. Second, 
a record low price of 10.9 US cents was obtained in December last year for a five megawatt solar project. It's one of the lowest countries, lowest PPA prices for a six countries. In this background, now the Maldives government is going ahead with 35 megawatt hours of storage and almost 25 megawatts of solar, solar which is big for a small country like Maldives in six. So what is Maldives telling us? If a small country like Maldives can take a pledge of net zero by 2030, which is what the president of Maldives did about six months back, uh, six months back yes, the, the, all the other countries also can go towards this net zero pledge. So in the next 30 minutes, if you wish to join us, we're going to detail out how with the co-financiers like AIIB, like CTF, and with other funder agencies, the World Bank is working together with the government of Maldives towards a sustainable future, green jobs, and recovery from these pandemic times in a much more sustainable manner. Thank you. Thank you, Amit. We appreciate it very much. Um, let's see, let me just say a couple of things um, about what is next and what to expect tomorrow. We'll, we'll be moving here in a minute into some breakout sessions. We'll have an opportunity to talk in more detail about projects in South Africa, in the Maldives, in Colombia, and Latin America. Um, more more generally. So maybe if we go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about that. And then I also want to give a preview of, um, of tomorrow uh, and make sure people are coming back um, for what we have to offer. So we, um, a slight adjustment on the fly here, we're going to have three uh, separate breakout meetings. As I said earlier, the Ukraine battery storage project, we will look to feature that in a, in a future meeting. Um, but what we'll do is, um, in a minute, share the links that will allow you to go into, into these breakout meetings. And what we have about an hour for this. So what we're hoping to do is rotate through every 20 minutes or so. So you'll have a chance if you're interested in all of these areas to be able to rotate through in the next hour or, or so. Our speakers will be running through their slides in the discussion for each of those sessions, but we'll also have time um, also have time for, for Q&A and we'll have a facilitator in each section uh, session uh, allowing us to track time and also providing the links in chat um, for those, uh, for going to additional additional breakouts. So um, we'll share those links in chat we have done it right now. Uh, if you look in chat, you'll see the the titles, the speakers, and the um, to the and the links. But don't go quite yet. Um, let me just talk a little bit about tomorrow for those um, who uh, who might be leaving us at this point. So maybe we can go to the next slide. Great. Um, so tomorrow we, we have another uh, three hours or so. And as I said at the outset, we're really going to be diving more into some of the near-term implementation issues, challenges, opportunities. We'll have a keynote from Dr. Christina Lampe Onarud, who's the founder and chief executive officer of Cadenza Innovation. Um, and partly the, the keynote will both reference Dr. Christina Lampe Onarud's insights from working globally, but also bring in a bit more of a private sector perspective, which will be a theme um, for, for tomorrow. Uh, we'll also be doing some crowdsourcing from uh, attendees tomorrow. We really want to be able to hear from you about challenges and opportunities that you are seeing that will help guide future programming for the Global Energy Storage Program learning platform as we go forward. So as we're planning future events, we're really targeting some of those key issues for you all that we can tackle collectively. Our panel tomorrow is going to be really about unlocking the value of storage, addressing some of those challenges, um, embracing some of those opportunities. And we'll have speakers from Climate Investment Funds, Energy Storage Partnership, and then representatives from um, some companies that are working both in innovation, innovative technologies and innovative projects on the ground, um, as well as hearing from some work in, uh, in India to provide energy access. So we'll be talking about different scales of storage, different types of storage, and different purposes and values of storage uh, tomorrow. And then, as I said at the very beginning of today, we'll have an opportunity for some informal networking tomorrow using, um, the, using an online 
platform for um, for giving you an opportunity to talk to some other folks that are interested in the area of, of energy storage. Let's see. Um, so with that, what I would encourage people to do is maybe just take a five five minute break or so um, as we move into um, the breakout sessions. We'll leave this plenary session open. Um, so if people sort of lose track of links or other things, you can always come back in here. My colleague Tess will remain in this space and help guide people to the sessions that they would like to attend. Um, when you click these links, it'll ask you if you want to leave this meeting and go into a new meeting, you should say yes. Um, that will trans transfer you over into the other meeting spaces. And that'll be true as we rotate through the Zoom meetings um, as well. So thanks everybody for attending today. Um, we'll take about a five minute break and then we will see you again in the Zoom meeting rooms.